Hello there, come on in. I've been travelling in my mind. Uh, often I go to favourite places like Amherst in Massachusetts, the home of the poet Emily Dickinson. It's the sort of New England town British people think all Americans live in. Clapboard houses, second-hand bookshops, cheesecake readily available. I sit on the grass and lean against a tree on the town common, idly reading. Across the street lies the inn on Boltwood, where I might pop for a beer as the summer sun sets. I've been many times, and the trouble with all this is that I know perfectly well that the inn wasn't called that the first time I stayed there. It used to be the Lord Geoffrey Inn, named after Geoffrey Amherst, who also gave the town its name. I'm not surprised they changed the title. Search a little and you will swiftly find that Lord Geoffrey was not quite the man you might want to memorialise. He was a British army officer, skilled at subduing the French, which was a popular enterprise at the time, but his legacy is controversial, to say the least. During Pontiac's War of 1763 against a loose confederation of native American Indian tribes, Amherst advocated exterminating the indigenous people by either giving them blankets infected with smallpox or hunting them down with dogs. It's an early example of a heady mix of biological warfare and genocide, and it's an important, if terrible, component of understanding the complex picture which comprises the founding of the United States. It wasn't just made by a bunch of Quakers who popped across the Atlantic to do good. This element of the story is not, however, what I was taught at school. I had most of my primary education in New York, where I learned that George Washington never told a lie, Paul Revere was the only one who knew the British was coming, and without America, Hitler would have won the war. I concluded my education in a truly dreadful boarding school in the home counties of England. Here I learnt that Henry VIII invented the Church of England, which is what God intended, and left behind a legacy of black and white buildings without which English tea shops would never really have taken off. Later, I would come to understand that the only other thing of importance in the whole of UK history was the Industrial Revolution, 1700 to 1850. Lots of men did lots of butch things with machinery, and women seemed to have stayed home for 150 years, as they were never, ever mentioned. It was hardly a rounded education about how the world works, and as an adult, it seems shameful. I think what we learn about history matters as, and this is a mad idea, it might just help us avoid repeating mistakes. The trouble is that the history taught in many schools presents a view which lacks context, is generally misogynistic, and certainly is incredibly whitewashed. I mean that literally. Sometimes I read about an incident from the past and the hurt from it continues to reverberate. You can feel it in your soul. In 1963, a man called Medgar Evers was living in Jackson, Mississippi. He was a World War II veteran, a civil rights activist, and the state's field secretary for the civil rights organization called the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. Medgar campaigned to end the segregation of public facilities and expand opportunities for African Americans. On June the 12th, 1963, he was murdered in his own driveway by a white supremacist. I won't dignify his murderer by naming him, but the man was tried twice for the crime without conviction. Medgar's wife, Merle, did not give up. She fought for justice, not just for her husband, but as an activist for others. She became chairwoman of the NAACP, and I first heard her name in 2013 when she delivered the invocation at the second inauguration of Barack Obama. There are so many names no one mentioned when I was at school. No one ever talked to me about Mary Burnett Talbot, who ought to be an inspiration to us all. Born in 1866 in Oberlin, Ohio, she must have been something, because by the time she was 20, she stood out as the only African-American woman in her graduating class from Oberlin College, where she received what today we would call a Bachelor of Arts degree. It was a time when such an education was considered controversial for any woman. Mary became a teacher and then assistant principal at a high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. In 1887, it was the highest position held by any African-American woman in the state. The treatment of African-Americans in her lifetime was gruesome. The Southern so-called Jim Crow laws excluded them from political, economic, public and educational spheres of influence. Mary used her position to speak out. 
She was a gifted orator and began to travel, lecturing across the US and in 11 European countries, educating her audiences about oppressive conditions in African-American communities and the need for legislation to effect change. She helped lay the foundations for civil rights activism in America. I was never taught her name. Nor was I taught to look more closely at any history. Examine the very white Tudor times a little more thoroughly and you will discover Catalina de Cardenas, who was black and for 26 years served as Catherine of Aragon's Lady of the Bedchamber. And Mary Phyllis, an independent black seamstress baptised in London in 1597. No one mentioned them. Head to the Industrial Revolution and you will discover Dido Bell Long, the first black aristocrat in Britain. We need these stories so we can see the past as the complicated tapestry of human experience it actually is, where everyone ought to be able to find role models and inspiration. I was five when Martin Luther King Jr. led the Great March on Washington in 1963. It's a story which is not simple either, for the women involved were not treated well. My heart breaks for the activist Anna Hedgeman, who had helped organise the event, personally recruiting 40,000 participants and making sure everyone had food and water. Despite this, she was not allowed to march at the front and not allowed to speak. When Dr King declared, I have a dream, she cried and scribbled on her programme how she wished he had said, we have a dream. After Dr King's famous address, he and all the male leaders of the march were invited to the White House. Not one of the women who was there, including the legendary Rosa Parks, was asked to go with them. Merle Evers never gave up the fight for her murdered husband. It would not be until 1994 that enough evidence was finally produced to send the murderer to prison. He had lived for more than three decades as a free man. But don't mess with a determined woman. Much of what lies behind us in human history is very ugly indeed, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't face it and try to understand how it influences the present. Too much of the past lies in silence. Now is the time to speak up. As I lean against my tree in Amherst, I feel duty-bound to read poetry in homage to Emily Dickinson, who I think maybe they should rename the town for. I shall read Georgia Douglas Johnson, a poet from the Harlem Renaissance who was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1880. She wrote a poem called Common Dust. It's a marvellous reminder that where we are all ultimately heading, there will be nothing to divide us. And who shall separate the dust, what later we shall be? Whose keen discerning eye will scan and solve the mystery? The high, the low, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the red, and all the chromatique between, of whom shall it be said? Here lies the dust of Africa, here are the sons of Rome, here lies the one unlabeled, the world at large his home. Can one then separate the dust? Will mankind lie apart when life has settled back again? The same as from the start. Take care. Be kind. Vox Talks is now available in podcast form. Check the description below for links to listen and subscribe. <laughs>